And here we are. You're very welcome to a new on location coming to you recorded live. We're live. We I am alive. alive. You're alive. I'm alive. We're both live uh, from RSA conference. And uh, it's been a good good day so far. And as you know, I'm the host of Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast, where I get to talk to cool people about cool things. One area I don't get to talk enough about that I love, operational technology. Why? Because I'm a nerd, for one. But two, it, it, it's involved in a lot of stuff that matters. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff that matters. So uh, I'm thrilled to have Chris Walcott on with me. How are you, Chris? Uh, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yes, and uh, direct defense here, full force, uh, having good conversations, protecting the world through uh, one OT device at a time. We're going to try. <laughs> Keep the bad guys out of the power grid, keep them out of the water, keep them out of your nest cameras in your house, you know. All, all, the, <laughs> all the good things we, we love. I like to drink water. Um, Clean water mixed with fact. what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, in the form of an ice cube over uh, under bourbon. No. Excellent. Um, all right. So we're, we're here to talk about ITOT, the, the conversions there, the, the need for visibility and control, a uh, different view of how we look at risk and how to tackle that with the teams that are already understaffed and uh, may not know all the details of those two worlds together. Um, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that. But before we do that, Chris, a few words about your role and uh, what you're up to. So I'm the chief security officer at Direct Defense. So in addition to the day job of trying to keep our, our enterprise secure, I also run a team called the Connected Systems Practice. It's focused around all things OT, SCADA, IoT. Uh, we get down in the weeds with manufacturing and commercial and industrial side. We get into critical infrastructure, you know, energy, water, gas, pipeline, all that fun stuff. And then we've got a side of it that's all about uh, hardware testing, breaking devices, working with the manufacturers, testing them, figuring out uh, how they can make them more secure. And uh, I want to pull on this thread to start. Um, I can envision a lot of teams thinking they know what their environment looks like. I can think of a lot of vendors, or technology providers, service providers that think they know how things work a certain way. Then I hear from you, you're working with the manufacturers, you're working with threat researchers. And th this view and, and in, in environments that, that matter. This view and this depth, I suspect, gives you an interesting and the very powerful view of what needs to happen. It does. It does. Across all of critical infrastructure, the energy sector is really the only one that has real regulatory teeth. So the bulk energy side can be fined a million dollars per day per instance of noncompliance for the NERC SIP regulations. Regardless of all the other presidential directives and regulations that have been put out, there's nothing else with that kind of actual enforcement capability that exists across any place else in critical infrastructure. So water, oil and gas pipeline, production, um, you move over into telecommunications and rail, everything's focused around safety. Um, there's not a lot that's focused around cybersecurity. And if there is, it's generally guidelines. You move over into the manufacturing space, and a lot of these companies have done things to protect their IT environment. They've got the perimeter firewalls. They protect the corporate side. On the OT side, they kind of put the security perimeter wrapper around it, but then inside that space, they don't touch it. It's very hands-off. This is operational uptime. We can't mess with it. We don't patch it. We don't scan it. Um, and they may not have the staff to understand what's really going on in that space. And then the hardware vendors are struggling because... There's not a lot of uh, agreement on what should be the cybersecurity standards for hardware. So IEEE's got 62443, UL has 2941 that hasn't been ratified yet. So when I, I haven't spent a lot of time in OT, so it's a new world for me as well. Sure. Um, when we look at IT, for many years it's been compliance driven. So you're saying there's not even a lot of compliance to help drive a lot of change in this space then? There's a lot of best practice, but there's not a you need to exist. Right. And so a lot of organizations haven't done what they need to, or they can't get the money. So in the U.S. anyway, in North America, the bulk energy sector is all these big private merchant energy companies. A lot of them are publicly traded. They've got a lot of money at their disposal. 
right? And they can go and make a case to charge more money for the electricity that you pay. But the water utilities, a lot of times are a small municipal government. Um, they may not even have a bunch of full-time staff. They don't have that same access. They can't necessarily go and make the case successfully to charge more money. And so they don't have the funding to do the same type of stuff. Interesting. So, so without, without the funding, it's, you say there are best practices though. So this there is are. just people who care and are trying to do the best thing then, or, or is it just doesn't happen? Some of it is people who care. Some of it really doesn't happen. Okay. Um, at least not until a breach happens. Okay. Uh, and we do breach work in both the IT and the OT space. And so we see that, that panic, that fear, mm. you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that doesn't make it into the news or is very tightly controlled and a little bit gets out because of the nature of what it is. Talk to, talk, tell me some story, no, no names. Right. I don't want to expose anybody here, but let's say want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I would imagine sometimes a breach isn't catastrophic. Right. An incident isn't, this doesn't destroy an environment. Sure. But it wakes somebody up. Right. Um, you get called and you help help with that. Maybe you can share, share some stories on that. But before the breach, there, there must be some signals, right? That, stuff's crossing over from IT and OT mm -hmm. or, or there's known weaknesses on Shodan that, that sends some flags up that people aren't looking. Well, I don't know. Tell me some stories of how organizations could have seen some red flags before, even if it wasn't catastrophic. Um, right. Some incident. Well, and sometimes they even get testing done and then just don't follow up. So I give you okay. an example of a large uh, energy utility in the Northeast deployed uh, smart meters call it five, six, seven hundred thousand of them across part of a state. And then they wanted to use that network. In doing that, they stood up their own mesh network, right? Devices can talk to devices to get back to the data center. So that gave them the ability to have this free mesh network. So they wanted to do something called recloser automation. Reclosers are basically giant circuit breakers. Think of turning on and off parts of the power grid for maintenance, or if you have an outage, let's say a tree comes down in a storm, you can de-energize one side to make it safe to work on. They'd love to be able to do that remotely and so to More do that california you want to, yeah well you know what that's a whole different thing roll out right rock. right uh the end run days yes uh, so you get an organization that says okay well we rolled out this network we're going to use it for something else okay. and they come up with a way to put these devices onto that network and they want a little secure gateway that's out on a box on a pole right out in somebody's neighborhood that's going to give them a secure communication path back to the data center well we went out and we tested one of these devices out in the field and found a vulnerability in it and was able to use it to get back to that control center, the energy control center. So this would have given a, a bad guy the ability to get all the way back to potentially control of the power grid. And so... Not just the control point, but... All the way back the to the control center, Okay, right? Because this device is talking to that control center. So we stop the assessment because this was not the full scope. And we create a little report and we give it to them and we say, we need to go talk to this particular hardware vendor and have them explain how they're going to fix the vulnerability. The problem was this vendor didn't do a lot in the space, was not a US-based company. And they basically said, you know, we don't really plan to do anything about it. We're not going to be forced to by anybody. This isn't really something we really care about. And because they didn't buy a couple of these devices and get them security tested before they put them in, now they've got to go buy three or 4,000 of something else and roll trucks and replace them all. And pay a fine to the government on top. While they're down. While they're down, yeah, exactly. <laughs> ah, all right. So this tells me, well, in that situation, they had some sense of risk. They did. They were doing some things. They were doing some things. It just wasn't a complete program. And I know you have this, uh, this term of resilience-based risk. Right. Because if they'd taken, I'm assuming, if they'd taken... Their, their analysis of what was important and what might impact that and kind of expanded that just a little bit more right. to say a replacement of this environment would actually be just as much, not more, more so of a risk yeah. to our resilience and, and the, uh, pe the penalties. Yes. <laughs> and you can expand that a little bit more. And this is where I always recommend that the OT side should talk to the IT side. There's distrust between them in a lot of organizations. 
And the downside is the IT side may have in the past done something, applied a patch and it caused an outage, right? They don't necessarily understand the true importance of, you know, five nines or whatever that uptime requirement is for the organization. But the OT side doesn't necessarily understand that IT is used to vulnerability management and patch management, and they've got tools and processes. And OT could and should be making use of it. So if they expand that out just a little bit and looked at it from a perspective of what if we need to patch that device? What if we need to manage the vulnerabilities and go back to the vendor and ask those questions? And the vendor says, well, we don't really have a patch management cadence. We're not going to, we're going to release patches when we find out about problems. Those are potential red flags for devices in that space. So one of the big challenges is getting to the point where the OT staff or even the procurement staff, right? To my mind, procurement is your friend. Educate them, let them help you. All the vendors that you bring in this space, you're inviting them into your ecosystem. This is how you avoid vendor transmitted diseases. If you don't want those VTDs, you get to know that vendor pretty well. You don't get in that relationship after, you know, one lunch or one dinner. Ah, yes. Um, VTDs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 let's... I'm speechless. I was expecting it, and I'm still speechless. No, I think. Do you need a security prophylactic? I, I do need one. I'm going to go to segmentation, actually. In all seriousness, the so you mentioned best practice, and yeah. I think there's a lot to learn from both, right? There is um, because IT, especially when you when you insert security in IT, can mm -hmm. often be seen as a as a, a disabled. Right business, so yeah. kind of blocking things, yep. which goes completely against the uh, the OT where it has yeah. to main. And it doesn't need to be sort of the organization of no. It it needs to be the groups coming together and figure out how you make it happen, how right. you make it work. There's always a way. Yeah, there's always a way. So I think both sides can learn a lot yep. from each other. Yeah, and I think this is where another, another interesting point comes up for what you do at, at Direct Defense because of all the experience you have on both. Right, as you can kind of help bridge that. We do. And if I remember correctly, you have a keen way of helping and a keen way of using words as well to help, <laughs> uh, to help translate the environment. So translating best practices, translating how things work in one environment versus mm -hmm. the other, why things are important in a certain way. Right. Um, so talk to me a little about, about what that looks like. So the translation goes back to really my first significant job in technology. Uh, I started on a energy commodities trading help desk for a big fortune 200 energy company. And over the course of my career in system admin, network engineering, network architecture, eventually I landed as the director of IT for power generation. So we had 37 power plants spread across North America. There were three nuclear plants in the mix and IT and OT really didn't trust each other. And so I didn't know a ton about OT, what it meant, what it was. And so I asked my leadership, if I could do some job shadowing and introduced a job shadowing program between IT and OT that really helped to foster that communication and build some trust, which made the whole organization better. And a lot of that has, was later adopted and is still, some of it's still in play. But because of that, the team that we have at Direct Defense on the connected system side, which is our OT practice, is all built from practitioners. Everybody who's on the team has been responsible for either designing, building, or running OT, SCADA systems. Uh, one worked for a big manufacturer and then ran a water system for a major city. Um, another worked for two energy companies and went on to run manufacturing for a well-known brand. Um, I spent almost 10 years with Constellation Energy, which is the parent company of Baltimore Gas and Electric. And then another almost seven with Black & Veatch, which is a large engineering firm that builds critical infrastructure. Uh, and we have another who was on a cyber Patriot team that I coached that won the national championship in 2016 and is a very well-known becoming world renowned hardware hacker. And so he's got the latest Google pixel vulnerability, uh, that Google Chromecast, excuse me, vulnerability and, uh, yet to be publicized series of vulnerabilities on another product that I can't yet speak about, but, um, this team fosters trust when we go someplace and we walk in and we sit down with the ot staff and you were talking plant managers plant control system engineers technicians we can tell them we literally have done your job we understand your technology we know we need to make sure that everything we do won't cause an outage 
won't take time away from operations. We're very respectful of the fact that there's one of you in a million square foot facility. We get it. And because we get it, they will open up to us and understand that we really are trying to help. We're going to help them try to figure out how they talk to IT to get the funding, to get the tools, to get the people, to get the training so that they can make that system more resilient, right? But they have to focus around things like vendors that release patches every 18 months or vendors that won't let you patch your own systems. So there's a couple of these SCADA system vendors. Factory repair is still an issue there. Mm -hmm. Some of these, and particularly in other countries, the team was over in China and Japan recently. And we're working with a very well-known SCADA system vendor that is also well-known for not letting you patch your own stuff. So if you don't have the annual service contract, they don't come in and apply the patches for you. When we saw one of the systems we saw hadn't been patched in almost 10 years. How do you get around that? Because you, you can toss security layer products on top. That's not going to solve that problem. Well, you, <laughs> you do, you, but they also don't have the visibility of what's happening, right? right. So without so you the don't visibility, you don't have a baseline. Baseline tells you what's normal. You see what's abnormal. You okay. can take some action. You could truly take that system offline from the corporate side if you wanted to. You could disconnect it from all things not self Other mitigating right tools. Yeah. That causes problems on the business side, but a lot of the business processes could be handled on paper if you really had to. Right. For some period of time anyway. And usually the manufacturers will tell you, hey, we can run on paper for eight hours or we could run on paper for two weeks before we have to stop. Um, but these vendors, if you don't provide them their annual service maintenance payment, they won't come in and apply your patches. And so that's about executive leadership realizing that that service contract is more than just what if, but it's ongoing life cycle that really needs to happen. And if somebody who understands the business side doesn't explain it to them, they just may not realize it. Back to procurement. Back to procurement. Sure. And, and leadership having the yeah. wherewithal to support that it's a necessary thing. Yeah. So responding to some of these things, um, I, I made a bit of a joke in terms of you, you just throw security on top of it and then that problem goes away. Yeah, hey, you spray it on instead right. of baking it in, right? right exactly. Yeah. But you do need some layers of security. You do. Similar to IT. It looks different, mm -hmm. acts different, smells different. Um, organizations need, to, I would presume, more OT teams. I'm thinking back 10, 15 years ago, 20 years now in cybersecurity and the IT side. Yep. Um, you don't just set it and forget it. No, right? it's and, continuous. And if you, if you don't know how to set it right in the first place, then you might be missing the mark as well. So talk to me a little bit about how you work with some of the security vendors to ensure that, to your point, it's going to help maintain and, and ensure resilience, mm -hmm. um, but not kill the OT team in the process. So, so a lot of that comes down to, one, having things set up so that you understand the, the criticality of the environment. So I still call a lot of this critical infrastructure, even on the manufacturing side. It's just business critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so some things can run on their own. Some things can't. Some things are critical, which shut down all operations, and some things don't. Even understanding and having a catalog, having an inventory of that, sort of the IT inventory problem brought forward 20 years, that OT inventory, what's criticality? This system can't run with that, without that. This business process requires that we take data from this and we take it out through a DMZ and give it to the business side, right? If you can't do that, there are some organizations that also shut down. Uh, we worked one breach a few years ago. One large manufacturing company bought another smaller one, and they had a 90-day window to establish their new technology stack on the cybersecurity side. And about 30 days in, the, the smaller company got breached. And one of the things that it did was it shut down their ability to ship product. They could still manufacture product, but they mm -hmm. couldn't ship product. Okay. If you can't ship product, you're out of business. Yeah. And so understanding what those critical processes are, you have to have the teams working together. The OT side has to talk with leadership. The IT side has to talk. You establish that nature of these are the things that we have to have. And that's how you start to build the roadmap for that security. Now, a lot of times the teams that are on the functional side on OT, they know how to keep it running. They know how to make sure that it does what it's supposed to, but they may know, not know a lot about the advanced side of cybersecurity. The way the market is right now, also one of the other challenges is that a lot of critical infrastructure is built in places in the world that people don't necessarily want to live. Hmm. So it may be out in the middle of nowhere. 
It may be an industrial area with a lot of other companies where there's not nice housing and great schools and some of the other things. And so it's a challenge to get the staff and retain them. And so some organizations end up in a situation where they need a good partner. Right. And we, as direct defense, get a lot of that because we get organizations, large, well-known name brands that you would recognize um, that struggle to be able to meet their staffing needs in the OT security space. And so when they can get some, they can have them on the road and traveling around. But if, you know, the organization I'm thinking of, 37 plants globally, um, they're not going to be able to find everything they need. And sometimes they'll have positions sit open. And so we become the force multiplier. Okay. We've got the experience. We've got good references. We've worked with other firms doing similar things. We can come in and give them what they need. And in some cases, actually help them make the changes. And because of what the OT background of our staff, they trust us. Um, they know that we're going to be careful. And then you go that step further and you talk about, well, how do we understand what's normal? You can buy, as I mentioned, you can buy the best OT visibility tools that are on the market. You can buy the, you know, the Clarities and the Nozomis and the Dragoses of the world. Um, they will help you get their product up and running. But if your network is not segmented properly, sure. you're not going to see the data you need. You're not going to get what you have to have from that. And so we will come in and do what they want. And that is help you make the specific changes to route the traffic across a point of inspection where you can see it and help to take a protective action. Got it. And then otherwise I'll, you end up no tail, no tails to chase. Exactly. Or too many. Exactly. And because these are not uh, situations where you can just install an endpoint agent, that's not a thing in the OT space for the most part. And then you go a step further. And if the organization is big enough that they do have their own IT SOC, that IT SOC doesn't know what OT is. They don't have any background or training. Um, you could train them, um, but it takes time. And so we also, as a partner, have started to work with the convergence of IT and OT on the managed services side. And so the IT SOC has OT cross-training okay. and a capability to escalate to the connected systems team that then have designed and built the stuff. And you get a cohesive capability for visibility, um, some semblance of endpoint protection. You can wrap in that risk assessment piece. We can do the incident handling and response and make the changes to get you the visibility and tuning that you need that the platform vendors, um, frankly, aren't prepared to dig into. While adhering to uh, the, the need to need to stay up and running. Be yes. resilient. Right? Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't be down just because you're yeah. under attack. You, you know, you mentioned best practice before. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of the OT space, uh, what's usually referenced is the Purdue model. Yeah. yeah. And the problem, the Purdue, the Purdue model is great in a perfect world, but you can't go seven or eight layers deep um, in a space where runtime is that important because a lot of these systems are 15 and 20 and 25 years old and they can't handle an extra 10 or 15, literally can't handle an extra 10 or 15 milliseconds of latency. Yeah. So you can't segment that far. So we boil it down. We usually end up with maybe three zones, four zones. So you've got kind of the operational zone, all the stuff that's taking an action. A lot of times you have the sensor zone, all the stuff that's taking readings. You've got kind of the control zone, all the stuff that's in charge. And then you're going to have a DMZ because you got to take that data. Usually it's fed to a historian and you've got to feed it out to either a manufacturing excellence or an MES system, or it might need to go to some sort of shipping or an ERP, like an SAP mm -hmm. that allows for the billing and the raw materials control and all that stuff. All business stuff. Kind of. Right. But you have to have some idea of where the data is moving and what it's supposed to look like. And that's once again, where the experienced staff comes in that have run manufacturing facilities that have run power plants and substations or water and wastewater facilities. They know what that data is. They know where it's supposed to go and what it looks like. Yeah. So Chris, as, as we begin to wrap here, um, let's, let's say something to two audiences. IT folks who have friends in OT and OT folks who have friends in IT. Yep. So the first I want to hear from you is, and I want you to draw upon your conversations with customers to see as he can. What, sh what can IT say or do to their OT counterparts to give them an aha moment that we're here to help, not force stuff, but to actually help with what's going on here? I think one of the biggest takeaways that I can, IT can offer to OT is let us help you understand where the data is going so that we can help you protect it. And we've got some of the tools, but we also know that we don't know enough to not make mistakes. 
So we need your help, but we also need you to listen. Let us show you what we can do and let's figure out where it makes sense. And the IT side is used to documenting the relationships and the data flows and things like that. And that's something that OT typically isn't. All right. So let's say that's a good, good tip and best practice. How about in, in reverse? What are some aha moments where, where OT hears what you have to say and, and they realize, all right, that, that makes sense. And I know how to take action now. Here's where, here's how I'm going to go have a conversation with my executive. So OT needs to understand that the world is changing. The attack surfaces are changing. They may already have ways that people could sneak into their environments and they need to ask for help. They need to understand that there are processes that need to be put in place that are different than what they're used to. And the goal is to maintain that uptime but it has to happen in a way that's a little bit more secure than it's been in the past. Um, a couple of areas that they're probably accustomed to that may not be going the right way, remote access is a big one, right? So a lot of times they'll have vendors that need remote access because they've got a maintenance contract. They need to let them in. They need to let them come in and do their periodic and, and it happens remotely, right? What they're probably not doing is shutting off those access accounts when they're not being used. They're not monitoring almost under the keystroke of what's being done in those remote sessions. And they're not necessarily restricting that account so that it can only get to very specific devices. The other thing that I want to tell OT is procurement is your friend. Talk to procurement. Take the time to educate them. A lot of times they may not have your level of technical expertise on those OT systems. But if you can give them a checklist of the 10 or 15 things you have to have, and there's some things you may not be thinking about. So if there's a vulnerability that's identified in one of your devices, it should be in the contract language that they need to notify you if you weren't aware and that there's some reasonable remediation window or that they help give you something else that can help protect you in the meantime, some sort of remediation action. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get it from the vendor, then you turn back to IT and say, what can we do to protect this in this short period of time? Oh, that's fan fantastic, Chris. Um... I think both teams have a lot they can they can gain from chatting with you and the rest of the direct defense team. No question, visibility, yep. the start, collaboration between the two, um, a, a skill set that crosses both domains. Don't Absolutely. Have it, don't have it now. Chris and team have it. Yep. <laughs> oh. And we're happy to educate everybody exactly. to become in contact with. Yep. So we're happy to help teach the team. The more you know about it, the better off we all are. Yep. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll close with uh, resilience-based risk assessments. Resilience-based risk assessments, I yes, think, indeed. Uh, I think it starts there. And, and the ability to communicate around that um, will help shape the rest of it. It does. It does. Perfect. Well, Chris, I could chat with you for hours, but uh, <laughs> we'll leave it here. And maybe we have another, another conversation, more stories. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for listening to uh, this episode. Coming to you from RSA Conference. Thanks for joining me, Sean, uh, on Redefining Cybersecurity. We'll see you here this week. Lots more coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you.